So this is a topic that's really um, dear to my heart because I've been working on this for about five years specifically on the land base side, helping casinos develop their online gaming strategies. And to the extent, and I know I joked about this earlier today, but to the extent that there's really no movement in real money gaming in the United States, um, the vast majority of my job has been to work on developing social. So, um, you know, I've, I've met Michael about, what, five, six years ago? Something like oh, yeah. four. Um, and I've been working with him since then. Um, one of my clients was Tropicana, which he's now supplying for. And my other client was Delaware North, which now he's a part of. And my other client was Pachanga, but I had no part of that. <laughs> and, and Jonathan has uh, kindly stepped in. It's been a revolve, a bit of a revolver. We're, we have a latecomer coming from Scientific Games. Um, so um, as you know, Play Studios has been working with uh, MGM, is super successful, and is one of the darlings of the social casino meets brick and mortar. So I'm going to start with a couple. Of, maybe you want to give a little bit about, about your background? both of you, and then we'll move on to some of the questions. Yeah, so I, I started my career at PopCap, um, running uh, the social uh, or social group for PopCap uh, with Bejeweled Blitz as, as the major game there. Uh, Ruby7 is four and a half years old, and we do Trop World for Tropicana Casino Group. We do Best Bet Casino for the Pachanga uh, Resort and Casino, and we do uh, Lucky North for the Delaware North uh, properties. A uh, team of about 120 right now, and uh, running as fast as we can to keep up with everything. Uh, my background is in the land-based casino business, uh, developing real money offline casinos in Macau and Singapore and, and uh, the Las Vegas Strip. I joined Play Studios in 2014, um, and I... You know, the company started in 2012, and I spent the first two years of that time, you know, with a lot of other real money casino guys saying no one's ever going to pay uh, real money for virtual chips. And meanwhile, you know, uh, Play Studios and everyone else had s scaled their businesses quite uh, respectably. So here we are. So I guess just to give a little background, I mean, from the land based casino point of view, I think a lot of people with the Ruby 7 deal, a lot of regional casinos have kind of said, wait a minute, there's something in this for us. So I think a lot of people are like debating whether you license or do you buy, is it worth it? I think what we had historically seen was only, a lot of the mentality was uh, if you're a regional casino or a single property casino, um, owning a social casino is really only for the people like MGM and Caesars. And I think, you know, Michael, your deal with, Ruby, uh, with Delaware North has really changed that. So. Um, maybe if you can give a little bit of background into your, your dealings with um, Tropicana and then Delaware North, maybe talk a little bit about how they view social casino a little bit. Do they view it something as uh, that's critical, nice to have customer engagement? Yeah, so actually with all of our partners, and it's really a requirement for, for us to work with them, um, we want them to go all in. With, with social casinos. It's a, it's a brand extension, but it's the perfect gamification for, for a casino. It, uh, there's a natural game mechanic that their customers um, engage with on their casino floors, and they bring that into the, the online world when they're not in the casino. So this is, you know, for Trop World, uh, which is the Tropicana app, um, that was definitely intended to be taking their brand into a new uh, place where we're acquiring millions of new players that probably have never heard of Tropicana, or if they have, uh, certainly not not outside the U.S. Uh, with Delaware North Group, uh, we wanted to do the same thing. We actually developed that Lucky North brand for them, and that brand is now becoming a unifying force within their casino group, uh, including renaming the rewards program and and things that 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 help that entity actually act as one. And then with Pachanga. Uh, Best Bet Casino is the brand that we've launched uh, for them, and they're very much looking at it as a not only a brand extension but a diversification strategy for the uh, for the tribal members. And when MGM decided to get in this, what what was the process like when you from inception to say we're never going to make any money from this? It goes very much against the casino strategy, like mindset. Uh, so that was in 2011, sort of, I guess, the early days of what we now consider social uh, casino. I think, you know, when we 
uh, took on the strategic minority investment from MGM, the, our respective expectations were really not so much focused on, I think their expectations weren't so much focused on the income statement of the social casino uh, per se, because I think no one at that time in 2011 really imagined that it would be able to scale to the degree that it has. Um, it was really focused on what our, uh, our core value proposition is to all of our partners, which is to deliver incremental trips, physical player trips to casinos and to enhance their uh, core income statements in terms of selling hotel services, selling uh, games, and selling food and beverage. So that, I think that was, that was really the original motivation. And uh, I think now at this point, you know, the sector's matured and uh, everyone, I think, realizes that there's a pretty significant critical mass of revenues associated with social casinos. So maybe they have something different to say these days. And I mean, it, I, were they c totally committed from the beginning in terms of um, pushing their players when they were checking in or supporting it from, from the floor, from the ground up? Or I was it kind of like a slow? Um, I think we had a, a pretty uh, unusually cooperative advantage. They've, they've been involved in every aspect of the growth of the company, and when they, you know, made the commitment to offer their uh, the, their rewards from their portfolio on the Las Vegas Strip, they really, really, really backed it up. So we have rewards across all their properties on the Las Vegas Strip, from hotel to food and beverage to entertainment to unique experiences, and they've supported us through offline promotions. If you go to Las Vegas, you'll see billboards for My Vegas on all the MGM properties. You'll see activations in, um, in, their, uh, in their centers. So um, I think they've, they've really, really supported us and delivered uh, through their offline channels. And has, have your land-based casinos have been supportive as well? They have. We have uh, very similar executions with digital signage and, and printed materials on property and of course the, the databases are very valuable for for us and, and the, the social casino app. So I mean, having worked with Delaware North, I think their aha moment was they did a player total listening survey um, to their they have like an agreed audience that they give like extra points to, comps and stuff. And they're allowed to contact them a few times a year. One was a social game study, the other one was a social casino study. I think for them they realized that 80% had played a social casino within the last 30 days, and of that, 34 had made a purchase, so or were purchasing. So, to them, they realized that th not only were they playing, but they were playing with someone else, and they needed those players back. So that's why they, I think, instead of licensing, I think they stepped up and made an acquisition. So they realized like how kind of important it was. Um, one of the biggest challenges I think in the social casino for the casinos is the content. Maybe can you speak a little bit about that? A lot of the um, the lamb-based operators have been hoarding their content. Scientific Games is not here to defend themselves, <laughs> <laughs> um, but they have chosen not to share their content, and it's the content that is often seen on the floor. How important is that to the lamb-based casinos? So for us, most of our content is from Real Money Gaming, either okay. from online or or from suppliers. So we have Konami, which we both share. Uh, and we have some IGT and Ballet Games as well. Uh, and, but those were from the studios that kept their social rights and didn't give those when they built the games for the, the land-based groups. Uh, but for the most part, um, I think both of us would say that games like China Shores and, and you know very, very popular games on the casino floor resonate really well with a social casino player. It's, it's kind of an obvious, so it, it's... it's there's no real big aha moment, but if somebody plays a slot game uh, religiously on the casino floor and they can play that online, that's going to be their affinity. Uh, in terms of uh, supporting and, I guess, reinforcing the, the land-based presence, I think we, we approach it in a couple of ways in My Vegas. The first is we have games that are branded after the resorts, so we have an Excalibur-branded game, uh, Mirage-branded game, Bellagio-branded game, and to do those... Uh, you know, we send a design team and artists and creative folks into the properties to really understand and, and you know, ingest the branding and iconography of each of the properties. Uh, so there's there's that a channel. And, um, in games like Pop Slots, we sort of have now created a virtual environment in which uh, people can sort of um, inhabit the casino floor that, that from an interior design perspective is uh, true to 
the casino floor of the Mirage or the Excalibur. Um, and then as it relates to uh, what Michael was talking about, um, certainly I think everyone knows that land-based uh, slot content has really performed in, in this space, and we've certainly seen it kind of both ways. We've, we are the games that we've uh, worked with Konami have certainly performed very well, and then um, our friends at MGM have told us that those particular games have also seen an uplift due to the players that we've sent them that have been habituated to that particular title in our app. So how do you, how do you convince side games and IGT then to give you that content? I mean, do, is, it an, is it just a non-starter? Is it something that maybe the land-based casinos can work together? I mean, it is such valuable content. It is, and, and we've had good luck with, with both Delaware North and, and our partners uh, talking with those groups to try to, to license out that content. I think they'll, pretty much everybody will be there in a year or two. Uh, it's just a kind of a slow, I mean, every, every single one of the land-based providers have a B2C offering that they're afraid is gonna get hurt by offering that content to other people. And they think it's a dollar that's gonna be stolen away uh, through the marketing efforts of us or somebody else. So I think once they kind of get over that hurdle and they realize the pie is actually much bigger uh, and it's it's not about stealing pieces of the pie, but it's actually increasing, I think that's actually going to be the, the turning point. And so. Konami was one of the first ones that did it, and uh, we're very happy to partner with them, and, and I think you guys as well. And are, are you able to access their content at reasonable rates, or is there sort of a price to pay to have that premium content? I mean, obviously no. you, made, you made the decision that it's a, a fair price because you're, you're licensing it, but um, is it, did it come at, like, I'm not asking for specifics, and I know everyone's under an NDA, but uh, obviously it was a premium, but it, was it a premium that you think is worth it? We do, for sure, I'm pretty yeah. sure. I think, you know, uh, e each of the titles, uh, you know, varies depending on, you know, its its own distribution and its own, you know, geographical presence amongst the casino players. We have a easy reference point for our controls because we make our own original games. So we're so if we're paying a license fee of X percent for a Konami game, you know, we evaluate that against the our original game in which we're paying right. zero. So, you know, I think uh, I guess I would say that our our continued commitment to the Konami, you know, franchise games probably illustrates how how well it does for us. Okay, that's a good point. I mean, and the reason why I bring it up is because I hear that the other two are sort of coming to the table slowly, but at a price point that might be slightly egregious. So, just something to think. So. Yeah. Well, I, well, I guess to that I would say it's it's just economics, and there, there certainly is a point a, a, above which it makes no sense. Um, right. So, we can I guess we can just wait until they get there. <laughs> um, so. Do you, this is an industry that's really fast changing. I mean, you hear, even for the past two days, how many times people are changing over their marketing, their creative, their strategies, they're constantly tweaking. Working with land-based, highly regulated companies, has it sort of hampered your ability to continually change at that fast pace um, and take risks? Have you found that at all? No, I, we operate pretty autonomously from that. Um, they do have creative review, but we've built systems where that happens very, very quickly and, and lets that not become a, a barrier. Um, but the marketing efforts of the land-based casinos are significantly slower than our marketing efforts, where we're launching 500 campaigns in a day and they're launching an analog mail piece that they planned six weeks ago or six months ago even. So we, we do, I mean, this world is like moving at light speed, especially for a social casino. And, and uh, it's, it's a little shocking for the, the partners to see how quickly yep. things are going on our side. Yeah, I, I echo that completely. I think, you know, the, the nature and the structure of our relationship with MGM, I guess, reflects both of our understandings that they operate a business with a different metabolism than Social Casino, and they've provided us the latitude where we've needed it and the support where we've needed it to grow. But I think uh, we certainly don't feel that, um, you know, they've gotten in our hair or, or prevented us from being nimble and decisive. Right, as far as the collection of loyalty and property management and reservation and call center systems that we interface with, there's definitely some that are provided by vendors that really haven't kind of uh, modernized um, to a, an easy API that's easily integrated. Um, but we sort of we sort of made it work. Um, I think 
as it relates to optimizing the program, you know, MGM in particular, not we have other partners that, um, that have a different perspective on it. MGM in particular, because they have such a giant critical mass of customers at, uh, across many tiers, they're very, very focused on understanding and segmenting and analyzing the quality of the players and the categories of their spending and their rates of return and those sort of things. And so not all of those things are, we sort of have to uh, or, and continue to hack together those things and if, if it's necessary we you know work in Excel but I think um, the ultimate focus on uh, understanding the the player tiers the profitability on on rewards is uh, is just sort of overrides any of those inconveniences so for us the um, probably the most interesting implementation is what we did for the Pachanga where we have a full concierge uh, app within our social casino app so you, the player can actually book a hotel room at Pachanga and they can get their rewards they can see their points uh, and that integration obviously is a lot easier because it's one particular casino with a large IT group uh, whereas with Tropicana there's eight different IT groups and eight different properties and Delaware North there's there's seven as well so uh, with that there's you know that this is a new world for all of them and uh, especially digital convergence that we're seeing and I think it's challenging everybody to think about how to make that happen. Have you seen, I mean speaking like uh, digital convergence, have you seen a change maybe in some of the casinos behavior um, in the fact that now that they have this digital strategy they are focused a little bit more on digital marketing. Have you been, a do you've noticed that maybe in their analog world that they've approached their businesses, their core businesses a little differently? I mean, we, we certainly have the probably the biggest um, impact that we've had is uh, just simply asking the question you're really not collecting emails uh, so true. <laughs> can't we do that one step would that help just a little bit go to, to digital world uh, and that you know that was obviously something that you know they knew they should do but they didn't really have a massive reason to do it and we're like, well, here's a massive reason to do it. We have to be able to communicate with these customers in a digital format, not uh, something that goes out in the mail where our conversion rates are gonna be zero um, to a app store to a download. Wow. So I, I think we push them a lot uh, just to think about that strategy different, all, all three groups. Have you noticed MGM? Uh, well, across the spectrum of our partners um, and across geographies, I would say their approach to digital or to data or to kind of systematic marketing is is pretty different you know uh, mgm as an example has been competing with some of the most sophisticated resorts on the las vegas strip for years and so they've really developed a, a, a really um high performing way to approach channels like email and direct mail and that sort of thing um, in asia you see uh, a fair amount of partners or reward uh, resort destinations that are monopoly or duopoly situations, and they've never had to outmarket because it's the only it's the only place to go in a given geography. So they may not have been as aggressively developing their data discipline. Doesn't mean their customer base isn't super strong, but it means that their modes of communication um, may not be as uh, data driven. And um, so you, you started off almost in the B2C space and then kind of pivoted to the B2B, um, first taking on Trop, then Delaware, and now Pachanga. Um, is it B2B down a path that you are going to continue on taking? I know like we heard yesterday morning, um, <laughs> B2B is dead, it doesn't work, it's difficult, all of that. What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that? Especially when you're dealing with the casinos, right? Yeah, I mean, the, it's... You know, it's not a silver bullet. It's one or two cylinders of an eight-cylinder engine. It, you know, obviously, the brand Tropicana is better than the brand Ruby 7. Um, it's been around since 1956. And uh, although they've lost some licenses with that brand in Las Vegas, there's still a street called Tropicana in Las Vegas. And, and so, you know, from a brand aspect and from a marketing aspect, uh, that was a much easier B2C launch than you know the Ruby Seven Casino or whatever we would have called it. So I, I think in each of our partners, you know, they have different reaches or different 
um, attributes that made us very interested in working with them. Delaware North services a half a billion customers a year through their organization. And that's very interesting to me when Facebook has you know, a little over twice that. And uh, so that, you know, there was a completely different world with Delaware North that we were able to go after. And, and you brought on stations as a partner, but it's a very different approach to B2B. Um. Um, I, I think, I guess our approach to partners, we would I'd say it's a couple steps back from a white label approach. Um, in the sense that we, you know, we provide and enhance our partners' ability to make money in their their core business, and then you know we make money in the in-app purchase uh, dimension of social casino. So uh, I guess if you wanted to paint it with a broad enough stroke, you might say we have a there's a B2B dimension to what we do, but we we sort of prefer to think of the relationship as more uh, comprehensively symbiotic. Right. And what's interesting is. You launched with the My Vegas brand. You've now launched Pachanga with the Best Bet Casino brand. Not choosing the brand of the casino. Why, why is that? So for us, we really wanted the Pachanga app to be a worldwide app. And Pachanga is an incredible brand in Southern California, and everybody knows that, that resort casino. But we really needed them to think about this outside of that geographic. That, that would have been a very half-baked way to launch an app is to focus on Southern California and have a Southern California social casino. So we actually came up with a name for them and, and helped them build that brand. And now they're fully embracing that as, as kind of their digital offering. Uh, same with, with Lucky North for Delaware North. We did the same thing with them. Because um, you've got a worldwide brand, right? I get the Lucky North and the Parisian, the Pachanga and the Chomp, right? But MGM. That one. Uh, I, st I think I'm still. We think we're still in in Michael's camp. I think you know when we when we recruit new partners, when we pitch our program to partners, um, we sort of think about it to say you know with with our games and our relationship, you can you can choose. You can't have all three of these things, but you can choose from three th these three things, and that is incremental trips and incremental revenue at your property, um, a way to engage and and or an extension of your brand. I don't think we're the best partner for the most uh, literal extension of someone's land-based casino brand. Um, that hasn't been our approach. But I think, I think part of the, the logic is, and f you know, f fairly enough, I don't think everyone gets this, but um, you know, the magic of social and mobile is that you can scale to one, two, five million DAU. Um, and I don't think by limiting yourself to the geographic um, catchment area of a specific property, even if it is in Las Vegas, that gives you the best opportunity to scale to a worldwide uh, critical mass. Okay. And um, w one of the, the pushbacks I get from a lot of my clients is, oh, I'm not really sure about this. We might, it might cannibalize our business. What do you say to that when you hear that from potential people that you're going to work with? So the the well-known fact is that they're already playing games probably from somebody else. Right, like and, the study. Uh, yeah, and al almost everybody is. So the, you know, there was a lot of talk two or three years ago about there being no convergence between social and, and real gamblers, and that's just not true. And we know that the affinity for that, that game mechanic is, is taking online at when you leave the property. So the, the, if there's cannibalization, it's already happening, and now you can actually recapture some of that cannibalization. And that's the way we approach it with them. Have you had that feedback, though? This is cannibalization, we're not sure Not, about not from any of our three, no. I'm wondering if it's just maybe more in, in the tribal community, maybe that, that the approach? Have you noticed the difference between commercial and tribal at all? No. No. Really? Um, our response to that line of thinking is, you know, we have almost two million DAU of players that play the game on an average of 85 minutes a day. They don't go to a casino every day, 85 minutes a day. So it's an opportunity for us to imprint the brand experience of their properties in a much more frequent way and something that they carry with them at all times of a day. Um, and I think the, the kind of sheer quantity of incremental trips that we're able to generate is, is probably 
pretty convincing in the sense that uh, it, it's an enhancement of, of their core business. And a lot of people were saying, okay, Caesars is now out of this business. And they, they, I think they did a great job being almost like the regulatory watchdog. Um, they two very strong individuals that made it their business to go around to a lot of regulators and educate them. And some people are saying now, well, without those watchdogs overseeing the industry, that there might be a movement towards additional regulation for social. Do you see that as a potential problem at all? Have you guys experienced that, thought of that? Uh, you know, well, you know, our president, Paul Matthews, is the chairman of uh, ISGA, chairman, head. Uh, so we, we certainly view, uh, we certainly take our responsibility for advocating for our, our interests uh, in the various regulatory environments very seriously. Um, and absolutely, you know, Caesars had a huge role in, in, in helping. So I think uh, to the degree that we have to uh, step it up uh, and, and stay, stay focused on uh, regulatory thinking, we, we certainly will. And you haven't seen any of that? No. Well, I, um, and I guess moving into ch to Asia um, is a big step, right? I mean, your presence there, I mean, what was the rationale for, for moving into Asia when it's sort of like a gray market? Have you got, had any, like, back on the regulatory subject, have you had any pushback from some of the people internally um, that, hey, this is a gray market, you know, be careful? Um, well, it's, I guess it's, it's, not, it's not really, I think gray is probably the more accurate term to describe uh, real money online in Asia. In, when it comes to social, the, the more common uh, outcome is that it's, uh, there's no specific regulation speaking to okay. social or the, or the free to play model. That's not universally true across all markets in Asia, but it's true for most of them. Um, but you know, given the composition of our ownership and our alignment with licensed entities and listed entities like Activision and, and MGM, um, I think our approach to regulatory uh, assurance is probably amongst the highest contrast of, of any of our friends. And so we, we do retain extremely expensive advisors uh, and counsel to make sure that we are compliant with any of the markets that we're in. Yeah, are there any uh, configurations of your team that needed to change once you were uh, more B2B than B2C? I mean, is there, you know, particular elements of your of your group and your production group and your, your I guess, marketing group that are necessary to service clients? Yeah, yeah probably. Good yeah, good question. The, the biggest role that wasn't there before was um, what we call account management which is the interface between the, the person at the casino and us to make sure that the marketing efforts are coordinated and the communication flow is there. So that, those are new positions that, that exist for us. Um, with the rewards program, there, you know, as we ramp those up, there'll be new positions around that as well. But for the most part, I mean, the, you know, we still operate a B2C with a brand from a casino and a tight partnership with casino groups. So it's not really a B2B play like a, game account or a, a you know typical platforms provider to to social casino right so you're doing most of the services on their behalf yeah we do all every every b2c service that that exists hi um what is for each of you the the biggest mistake uh you made in the beginning when moving to the social slot area with games that already exist so the biggest mistake I made is I have a team in India, and I was convinced that this idea of a slot game was fairly easy to understand, and and uh, you know it's an art package. You put a little music together and and watch the real spin and create a win. Uh, so that that was probably you know our our initial efforts of internally developed games. It's like okay, there's some secrets here uh, that this industry has spent decades learning. And uh, so that was, a, that was a naive CEO at that time. I, I've since fixed that, but uh, that was 2012 error. Um, in, in, our, in the history of our company, we've had uh, a couple sort of existential 
decisive moments. One was in which we decided to refocus the entire resources of the company to get onto mobile as fast as we could um, and really stabilize the Facebook business but really start to focus purely on mobile. Um, and whenever we have made decisions like that, we've always been very sensitive to, well, if we had done that a quarter before, or two quarters before, we might have a business that's uh, substantially bigger. And I think that's just uh, reflective of the fact that this is one of the fastest moving and most dynamic um, businesses around, particularly when it comes to new channels. Um, so I don't know if you'd call it a mistake, but uh, we certainly look back at, at those of us uh, that, that were early in the business and always feel that you know, when it came, come, came to this genre or this feature or this channel, even earlier would have been better. You know, building on both of your points, I'll never forget the day or the month that WMS launched their B2C um, jackpot party. And you know the industry was sort of maturing and it was stabilizing. And then this thing just came out of nowhere. Uh, within a quarter, it was like shot into the top 10. And I asked the guys at WMS, what is it about your content? Like, this is insane. Like, I've never seen and app move this quickly and stay there. And they said it was the quality of our content. And I'd been in the online gaming sector for, at this point, six years, seven years. But I, I was really incredulous as to actually that it does make such a huge difference because they were able to shoot into the top 10 within a month. It was unbelievable. And, um, and onto the mobile, I, I kind of use the mobile example to people a lot as the reason why even though a lot of people say, oh, it's really hard to break in and it's really hard to move up, that there is room for movement. There are new opportunities that are opening all the time because the companies that made it on Facebook and were able to um, quickly transition onto mobile had a really good early advantage in that pivot. And so it's just about what's going to be the next pivot, the next opportunity. Uh, just to follow on that, I think at this, I don't know if you'd call our, our sector mature, but there's certainly uh, some companies that have, that have gotten reasonably big, at least within our sector. And, and our, our, com our company is still less than 200 people. But from an organizational philosophy perspective, you can really feel the difference between a 30-person team and a 200-person team and how decisive you can be and how nimble and reactive you can be to emerging trends, you know, new genres, et cetera. Um, I think every, every one of us, and certainly those that have scaled to a certain degree, have had to really struggle with that. You know, our approach at, at Play Studios has been, I guess, twofold. Number one, we've, we've acquired now uh, a, a company here, Shaker, which is now Play Studios Israel, and that's provided us a way to inject a lot of new perspectives and new energy and new culture into their product, Pop Slots. And then, you know, with, with the team that I've built in Hong Kong, it's sort of uh, trying to form a new culture that can not only be consistent, but also be reactive to that, that area. So, you know, when we think about even bigger companies and understanding that we think that the sector will continue to evolve and change so rapidly, I think part of all of our challenges is how do we keep that, that feel and that culture and that quickness that comes with a, a smaller team? Well, it'll be interesting. I mean, it, there, it's true that like the land-based casinos are now looking, thanks to the Ruby 7 deal, to the, the, the smaller ones are looking to get in this in a more concrete way. So it'll be interesting to see the influence that the land-based casino industry has over this industry over the next coming years. So uh, you're talking about opportunities for casinos, land-based casinos, to have um, like a place in the social platform. But if every new, because every land-based casino will make themselves a um, social casino brand, so the market will be swamped by many casinos out there. So a uh, solution like you were talking about the uh, game network, um, game account network, uh, what, maybe what you did before in, um, in Ruby 7, um, I mean, how do you cope with that? You can't, uh, not every land-based casino can buy themselves a social uh, presence. I mean, unless you do some platform, you use some platform, maybe this guy behind me has something that can offer that. But 
the strategy of buying, I'm not sure that this is the best solution. It's, it's very expensive to own a social casino. Uh, no, no, I, I'm sorry if, if I misspoke or if, if you misunderstood me. I'm not saying all the 450 casinos are going to buy an online casino, but mm -hmm. they have been looking, more and more have been looking, the larger the ones have been looking at now possibly acquiring, but to date most of them had been looking at licensing. So it is, includes licensing of the Game Account Network or the Sci Games platform. So, but setting up a, a presence, right? A licensing presence is what you were saying. Yeah, uh, but I'm saying, you know, at, at the end, look at uh, MGM. They bought themselves a social casino. Look at Delaware. They bought a social casino. All the others, I mean, they're losing the opportunity. They're losing, uh, uh, they, they don't have no one to buy unless they go to Game Account Network, but then right. it looks like very generic, looks the same. Users, by the way, the machines that you were talking about, for them, for Game Account, it's very easy because they, don't tie themselves with a specific, um, um, yeah. So I mean, it's like this is like catch twenty two here for the land based casinos. Right. There's uh, no. He, right he has maybe an answer. Uh, well, just point of clarification: MGM does not own our company. <laughs> I, knew, I was. I was thinking <laughs> they, that they are a, a, a minority uh, shareholder, a strategic, highly strategic minority shareholder. But uh, I guess to, to answer your question. Or to th the one way to think about your question is, it, it, it kind of goes back to what is the what is the objective of of the land based the hypothetical land based property in question? Is it to really enhance their income statement by adding an in app purchase line in their in their kind of revenue mix? It doesn't have to be that, and it may not be that. And in fact, you know, if you're if you're shopping amongst the bottom, you know, two hundred of social casino games, it might not be material for your $300 million grossing casino to add that to your income statement. You may otherwise be focused on things like re-engaging your customers, um, enhancing the frequency by which and the channels by which you communicate promotional or, or reward experience or resort experience with your customers. Um, or it may be simply a, it may even be a loss leader, uh, but a brand extension. So you know, it may be, um, I guess what I call a logo cap Right? It's not really a profit center, but at least I have guys walking around wearing you know, a, a cap with my property name on it. I have an app in the App Store, there it is. It may be whatever position in the chart it is, but I have my app. So I think that you know, depending on, on the property, they, they really have to be clear as to what, what they hope to get out of it. Not everyone can own you know, Playtica, and there's not that many Playticas out there. But uh, I think that in, in our particular model, we don't offer a piece of our income statement to our rewards partners. But we do offer a way to generate incremental trips, and for, for certain ones, a way to have their uh, property brand visualized in the space, uh, not through a white label, but in the kind of larger umbrella of the Maya Vegas universe. So you see it, so you see it as more of um, get some of the marketing budget, and like doing a, a, this is like instead of putting the money on a billboard, just put the money in a social, like, um, uh, game that you can also use for different stuff like user acquisition and engagement and stuff. And yeah, I think. With this for a while. Yeah, there, there's an, another view of this as well. Is I don't think there's going to be 450 casinos launching their own app in the App Store. I mean, it, it takes almost exactly the amount of, same amount of team effort to run a thousand DAU social casino as it does to run a million DAU social casino. It, you, you still have to have all of the, the cylinders working to, to have the game successful. So it isn't, I don't even think licensing for some of the very, very small casinos makes sense unless you do a very, very generic play for fun type implementation that Psy Games can scale across all of their different casinos, which is not our business model. And even though they're generic, if you have the right content, I mean, there are a couple that I know of that are just generating, you know, 50, 75,000 a month without even trying. And they're small casinos, right? So for those casinos, that's a nice, you know, sum of money because it's coming in without much effort. So, but I agree, it's that trade-off. Um, so speaking of smaller casinos and uh, uh, possibly also smaller uh, or independent um, social casinos, um, developers, do you think there's a lot of uh, potential for partnerships between like 
you know, a small tribal casino and a small independent developer or possibly even a way for a uh, new person to break into the social casino market with a, uh, by seeking out a partnership with a tribal casino? Or do you think that everyone who is doing this n will need to have an established base already? You can take that one. <laughs> I, I think there, there's kind of two views on this. I, I think it, if it's a good partnership, that makes a lot of sense. So if it's a good team and a good team and they're both working together, then it's certainly not going to hurt to have, you know, a, a large tribal casino backing a, a social casino game. If it is, you know, a, a small regional um, casino that's marketing to a small regional audience and they're going to try to plug into that and that's all it's going to be, that's going to be a thousand DAU and that's not going to work. So it, it really has to, to be something greater than that, and, and the teams have to really have that same mission to, for it to be successful. Thank you guys so much. But thank you guys, and thank you, John, for stepping in. Really, great job. And thank you.